My wife and I live in an inner city neighborhood in Atlanta, three miles west of downtown Atlanta. It's an old neighborhood, it's a diverse neighborhood. Some of the families in the neighborhood are female, female headed households, multiple children, black, minimum wage, hanging on by their fingernails. Um, we work with these kids to try to give them other options than joining a gang and ending up in prison. Some of these kids are, are bright. I think that brilliance is equal, evenly distributed among people regardless of their color or nationality or religion or what have you. These kids, we, we, I could talk for hours, I won't, about specifics. The idea that we're trying to convince these kids that they do have a future as productive citizens, educated citizens, um, able to fulfill their dreams. Perhaps they won't be the next Michael Jordan. That, the odds against that are pretty high. Um, many of them have aspirations to sports because that's what they see on TV. Well, black people can su succeed it's in sports or music, uh, but not in any other field. We give them options. The cost of a kid going wrong is the vandalism to your property, the cost of law enforcement, the cost of the correction system and the profit that some firms make from that, and the cost of stifled lives and unrealized talent. Now, that's just one person. Multiply that by millions and you get an idea mm -hmm. of the cost of, of, of the isms. I've got plenty of questions, but I believe our audience probably has some of the same questions that I might pose. So does anyone uh, want to join the conversation? Anyone have any questions uh, that you would like to ask? Don't all jump at once. <laughs> yeah, right, right here. And perhaps start with your, and start with your name and perhaps where you're from. Given the rules, Brother Jeff. Yeah, we want you to have your name and maybe a little bit about yourself as you mentioned. Just where you grew up, yep. not a dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Well, as, as you probably know, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was in fact nonviolent. Some of us saw nonviolence as a tactic, and some of us saw it as a way of life, and everybody else was in between. Um, the, I think that a lot, of the, a lot of the violence we see in our community is rage at one's circumstances. Uh, directed often at other people. And we certainly have had some dramatic examples of, of violence being meted out at innocent people, uh, sometimes small children. Um, and that, of course, has sparked a, a debate about the, the, the weapons of violence. But I think that nonviolence was a very effective tactic at least, a strategy uh, for, for a movement which didn't have the weapons or the badges or the authority. It was, the song that was sung at the beginning was one of those songs that we sang to, if you can picture a crowd of people facing police ready to beat heads and haul, haul people to jail, we're standing there singing about freedom, all of one voice, nonviolently. 
we eventually carried the day. We haven't finished, but we certainly made some gains because of that nonviolence. People could see that we were accepting the risks of being injured, killed, beaten, jailed, what have you, uh, and not fighting back. That's a powerful statement. And other movements, of course, have, have often, have usually adopted the same, the same strategy. I want to open that up to the panel, and I want to kind of uh, jump into where uh, Karen was talking about the message that we're sending young people and the message that society sends. Um, Nonviolence in today's world, is that still a, a tactic or, or an approach that you, deal, that you think is, you know, um, <coughs> worthy of pushing forward, and what message are we sending when we have those, how we glorify and honor a lot of the violence that takes place in society? Um, I want, yeah, I'm really glad that you asked that. Um, I'm in a band, and one of our songs, we actually have a song about the blue angels that fly over football fields. Um, you know, it's kind of, it's, and it's, we kind of um, sing about how it's really getting us prepared for warfare in this entertainment kind of way. Um, and so I think there's a personal responsibility and accountability to ourselves to really recognize that when we can and step up against it, say something against it, not stand and salute um, and do those things when we're kind of questioning. Uh, and I mean, it does, it, you know, I think it takes one person to really start that kind of movement. Um, but I think, you know, in those instances where you start recognizing it, it is, it's so latent, it's subliminal, and it's in our language, it's in how we act, it's in our entertainment. So. I think starting to take recognition of that and then taking personal responsibility in how we each as individuals buy into it and potentially support it and continue it on, if that makes sense. Gail? Yeah, I wanted to touch on that as well because I agree with Sarah here. You know, it's so um, marketed to our children with the videos, with TV, even in the music videos. I mean, everything is about violence. And you know, growing up through the civil rights movement, we did not project violence. We wanted to do everything, you know, in a nonviolent way, so that we could get our point across. Because you know, with violence, you don't get a point across. A lot of times, you know, things would happen where it would become violent because we were, you know, we would be beat up by the the cops, or our houses were raided, and and that kind of stuff. But we weren't out there trying to pursue this. I think we have, with this violence going through the media, our children are becoming insensitive about human life and human value. And we as parents have to keep instilling that into our children because that's where it starts. It starts at the home. And we have to start you know, raising our children and not let them be uh, programmed by a TV or by the music they listen to or the videos they play. Wow. But, yeah. And, and then still following that theme, we're talking about, you know, we just passed some gun control measures. Um, we're talking about all of this heavy artillery, et cetera, that is being um, widely, made widely available. Um, what does that, what, is, what message does that say to you? What do you think about when you think about the gun control, uh, the mass killings? You know, Colorado is kind of like the poster child now. When you think about Columbine, you think about the Aurora Theater, Etc. cetera, um, what comes to mind when you compare the nonviolent movement of the 63 and, or, and pr a little before up to now? What's the legacy? What, what comes to mind for any of them? Well, what comes to mind to me is, you know, like with the law of the gun control. I mean, this law was passed in, uh, by Clinton administration in 1986. And then when Bush came into office, he just ignored that complete law and put it on the back, back books. They do that all the time. I mean, these laws are already here, but they allow them to, um, you know, once they're up over 10 years, they just, they stop it and they don't pursue it. So then it then gives the control to the corporations who control the, comp the country. And it's the gun corporations that are controlling, you know, a lot of our government because it's their, they make the money off of it. It's a capitalization off of it. But what's happening is that it's affecting our children and it's affecting our youth. And they see this violence, and like they said, they become insensitive to human life. And you're seeing this by these young, younger people that are taking out massive, you know, uh, populations of people with not having any, any remorse or concern for their fellow man. 
to the audience. Questions? Uh, I'm Ernest Bonner, and I'm probably one of the few people in the room that admit to that pig <laughs> and grew up in the south of Memphis, as a matter of fact, my little king died two miles from my house. Uh, but my question is twofold. What are, don't you think that all of these uh, gun issues and protest issues are actually uh, a mask for income inequality? And so just, you know, it seems like they emotionalize all the hot button issues, but uh, skipping the real issues. That's my first question. And the second question is, what are we going to do about taking money out of politics? 